That's a part of a long ongoing process of analyzing what is going on across the equatorial Pacific. And so we've been watching the water levels steadily warm up across the equatorial Pacific from the central Pacific to the eastern Pacific. And those are all showing the indications of a change in climate. And this is in regards to the Nino Southern Oscillation. And so we've been in a very quiet period for the last three years across the region with La Nina persisting for three years. That has come to an end. We went quickly to a in so neutral pattern. Now we're shifting into the El Nino pattern. Um, this is uh, the latest declaration from the National Weather Service, NOAA, uh, just in the last week. Yeah. You know, we know with La Nina, and particularly in Australia, we had lots of flooding, um, you know, sort of heavy, heavy rains. What sort of weather events are associated with El Nino? Yeah, for us in the Western Pacific and Guam across Micronesia, a lot more tropical cyclone activity. And so we've been uh, broadcasting this for a while, for months of the year already, that any shift from the La Nina pattern, which is very likely, uh, could indicate more tropical weather across the region. We just suffered Brexit from Typhoon Noir here on Guam, or back in Guam. Um, we could see a much busier rest of the year ahead of us. And so we're going to be communicating that uh, later this month with the release of our Western Pacific Typhoon Seasonal Outlook. That's set for public release on June 29th. But we are looking at increased activity across all of Micronesia. But then the following dry season, this is where the rainfall patterns shift. We typically have a much drier dry season across all of the Western Pacific. Uh, they can cause drinking problem uh, issues across many of our outlying islands, across the Marshall Islands, Micronesia, and even in Palau. Impacting water. Um, Australia hasn't taken this step yet. Do we have different criteria to to make this judgment? Because we are one of the countries that are looked to in terms of declaring an El Nino or a La Nina. Yeah, I'm definitely not the climate expert regarding the INSO, but definitely uh, the Bureau of Meteorology, Bureau of Meteorology in Australia, they work closely with the United States Weather Service. We're looking at those in, same indices across the Pacific. And so we're all coming ac across these same conclusions that we are going toward the El Nino phase. In terms of the heat, how problematic is that, do you think? You know, we've talked about global warming as well, but when an El Nino kicks in, does that really compound the problem? Well, it definitely shifts the global weather patterns around the world. Uh, every The effects across different continents varies, uh, but we're focused very much on the Western Pacific. And so we are looking at those warmer water temperatures, especially across the central and eastern parts of the Pacific. That would have impacts in those areas. But again, for us in this region, uh, it's going to be a lot more tropical weather activity, uh, potential for more landfalling typhoons, and of concern, those rapidly intensifying uh, tropical cyclones that can increase several categories before we can landfall on any specific island. Yeah, that is so troubling. As I mentioned at the start, you're in Korea. I'm sharing your expertise in typhoon management. How similar are your experiences, say, in Guam and across that region, across the continents, in terms of, say, Southeast Asia, South Asia? Yeah, you know, this is uh, part of the UN SCAP's typhoon committee, and this is the 18th working group on disaster risk reduction. And this is a, a body of 14 member of the nations that we're meeting together to talk about reducing our risk and vulnerability to all kinds of natural disasters. And so nature knows no boundaries. And so that's a problem for all of us in the Pacific region. We can come together and talk and collaborate about the latest research on early warnings, hazards communications, how we can protect our populations, especially in regards to tropical cyclones. And, you know, of course, Guam is a smaller island, but when we look at some of these bigger countries, I, I imagine it's, you know, we talked earlier about that very sort of family orientation that Guam has, but for bigger nations, does that, is that more complex for them to manage? Yeah, it's definitely more complex because you have a much larger population. On Guam, we're a very tight population, about 170,000 folks. We have one consolidated message and voice with our media partners, our security and FEMA partners. But in other countries where you have much larger population centers, cities spread across larger areas, it's much more of an educational 
an outreach uh, problem that the local weather for authorities really have to overcome to make sure that everyone across their societies are well prepared well in advance and get that educational information before the hazard strike.